All right, if you have your Bibles, I'd ask you to turn to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. We're going to begin reading in the verse, the first verse. And um, while you're turning there, I will remind uh, everybody that unless something unforeseen has happened, the men that can and will be available Saturday, we're going to meet here. We'll say 8 to 8.30. We'll kind of see what needs to be done for the new room downstairs. And we'll go to, over to Brigham Hardware and get what's needed and at least get a good start of what we're going to, what we're going to need. So uh, if you can be here and you're available, please come. And uh, I know the Lord will bless us for our efforts. Acts 9, in the very first verse, the Bible says, And Saul yet breathing, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into, unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shone round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. I'd like to preach, the Lord be my helper this evening on the thought, giving yourself to the Master. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you for our church. Lord, we praise you for each and every person that makes it up. Lord, we pray tonight that you might meet with us. Lord, that you would seem, it would seem good to yourself to come down and to fill the house and that you would be with the people that sit here before us. Lord, that you stir us up to your service. Lord, that we might understand and know uh, that we're nothing without you. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now we see some fairly familiar verses of Scripture. But sometimes I think we miss the boat in one sense with this text. No doubt the conversion of Paul was amazing, an amazing thing to happen. But the real gist of this is giving yourself to Christ. The last verse there, the fifth verse, and we'll go back to it in a minute, says, What will thou have me to do? Now that is total submission to, the, to, the God, to God's will for your life and not you keeping something back for yourself. Now if ever there was a time, now is the time where we keep something for ourselves. If it's money or if it's possessions or whatever it may be, we want something that we might possess. Well, uh, let me say this. First of all, you have nothing were it not be for Christ. You have nothing, not one thing you own. And if you, if you really think about it, it's not yours to start with. It, it doesn't belong to you. It, it, it is not. It, it's yours only for a season. And if you don't believe that, go across some of these hills of Stewart County and find you a cemetery. And then you'll understand it's only yours for a season. It does not belong to you. And so, that is what our life consists of. Ver, uh, the first verse, chapter 9, And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Now, I'll say a couple of things. First of all, Paul had heard of Christ. He knew what Christ was about, at least with the intellect. He had not met Him spiritually yet, but he knew some things about Christ. And in that, he hated Christ. Now, that seems pretty bold and seems a pretty, a pretty sad situation. But listen, if it weren't for the goodness of God, you would hate Christ too. 
You would hate everything that He stands for. You would hate His purity. You would hate His deity. You would hate who He was if it wasn't for the Lord God and Him saving your soul. And so, what Paul was doing was really just displaying what we all are without Christ. Verse 3, And as he journeyed, he came near, to, near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. Isn't it a wonderful and glorious thing this evening, the day the light came on? The day the light came on for me, and I saw myself as a, as a needy sinner. And that Christ was the only answer. That was my only hope and my only help. The day, see, that's what the light will do. It will make you see yourself as you really are. And listen, that first glimpse ain't a pleasant look. When you see how filthy and vile and ungodly you really are, and it's not a pleasant thing. But thank God for the light. See, Paul was a man climbing the ladder. Paul was a man that had the benefit of being both Roman and Jewish. He, he, he had the best of both worlds. And he knew how to use it to advantage. He was moving up the corporate ladder. But you know what? In one instant, he saw how useless that really was. You know, some people go through the entirety of this life. And all that really matters to them is how many dollars they can get in the bank. And you know what? They never really even see the uselessness uh, of that let's go, go, go. They die in a condition where really that is still their God. Verse 4. And he, meaning Paul, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, one thing I'll say this. Paul never answered this question verbally. But you need to answer it tonight. Because if you don't belong to Christ, you are persecuting Him. If He has not saved your soul, you're a persecutor of Christ. If nothing else, you're denying who He is. And nothing, if nothing else, you're denying that He's a deity. If nothing else, you're denying that He is sufficient for your sins. Why persecute thou me? Now the answer is very simple, and the persecutors of Christ is this, they're lost. That's a very, very simple ex explanation, but everybody that's lost really is a persecutor of Christ. Uh, they, they don't like Him. They, they, they're against what He stands for. They're, they're against His purity. So the simple reason, the simple explanation, the simple answer to His question is this. He was lost. Paul needed to be saved. He needed to be born again. Verse 5. And he, meaning Paul, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, listen, this evening, if you think you're saved and you know you're saved and maybe you're being dealt of of the Lord, you look at those pricks real, real carefully. Because if you've never been gouged a little bit by the Holy Spirit, you may not have what you think you do. See, those pricks will always goad you toward Christ. You know, when you goad an animal like a like an ox or something, you slam him with a goad. That's what these pricks are about. And they will prick you toward the person of Christ. They won't prick you toward baptismal waters. They won't prick you uh, toward joining the church. They'll prick you toward Christ. And it's always been that way. And listen, if you lack that pricking of the heart... You may not be saved. You may not have what you think you have. See, that gold, that prick will always push you toward Christ. And you know what? That should be a desirous thing of us. If you're saved and you know it, a good prick every once in a while is good for you. Get you back in line. Take you back to the, to, to the throne of grace. And so, uh, I want you to see, and I believe all since the day when Stephen looked up and said, I see the Son standing at the right hand of the Father. From that day to this, Paul had been pricked. Quiet in the evening after, he'd, after he had 
uh, gone as far as he could for that day, patted some Jews on the back, and then patted some Romans on the back, and advanced as far as he could for the day, he'd stretch out, and he began to think of old Stephen. What was he talking about? Who did he see? Because see, the devil wants you at ease, but at night, when you're the only one there, that's when the pricking should occur. You know, that's one thing, and including myself in this, we watch too many videos at the house. But you know all that really is? is to numb you out. If you, if you watch TV or play video games to the point of exhaustion and then you just fall out from sleep, you, you've kept this mind numb. You've kept it without thinking about the things of God. And then you just collapse and sleep and start all over again the following day. Listen, you abide there. There's no room for the pricks. There's no room for the gouging. And so we see then, we as the Lord's people, it ought to be a desirous thing of ours that we get an occasional gold, that we get an occasional prick from the Lord so that He might tell us what we need to do. Verse 6, And he, meaning Paul, and he trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Now that, that, that is the mindset of an obedient Christian. That is the mindset of someone that is totally sold out for Christ. Lord, what would you have me to do? Now we want to put all kinds of qualifiers. Uh, well, you know, I've got a good career going here. I've always lived here. My family's been here since it was part of the North Carolina Territory. All these reasons why we can't do this. That is not a spirit of what will thou have me to do. That's the spirit of I'm in control. I'm driving this cart. And God is not pleased with that. Not even that much is He pleased with that. Lord, what will thou have me to do? Now, if we can get our, our mind and our flesh contained enough that we can truly ask this from within ourselves, you know what? He'll tell us. If He wants you on the back side of the desert as He did Moses, He'll tell you. If He wants you down in, in, in uh, Egypt, buying for the freedom of the children of Israel, He'll tell you. He'll put you exactly. But it's only when you get to the point, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Well, well, what's your will for my life? Now, I'll say this. Mostly why we don't do that is because we don't want to know. Right. We really don't want to know. Right. Because see, when you do know, then you become responsible for it. And so, much of the time, we would choose to abide in stupidity and, stu and, and, and uh, choose to abide in this numbness instead of finding out there is a thing the Lord would have me to do. Now, go with me to the Gospel of Matthew. And any time that you want to look at a subject in the Bible, always use Christ as your first example. Uh, Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to begin reading in verse 36. Matthew 26 and verse 36, the Bible says, Then cometh Jesus unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here, while I go and pray yonder. Now, you, you can answer your own questions about your own prayer life, but let me say this, if you don't have a prayer life, make your calling and election sure tonight. If you don't have times where you sit alone and talk to the Lord Jesus, and let me say this, if He don't meet up with you, you know, you know what the, uh, the fallacy of Catholic prayer is this, it's nothing but rhymes. It's nothing but chants. Uh, you know what? Uh, the, even the, the Lord's Prayer, as it's called by some, you know what it really says about it? It says it's a model prayer. That's not for enchantments. That's, uh, that, 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 uh, that, that's not to be repeated. He was giving us an example and nothing more. And, and so we see then that we ought to be able to pray and have a, and have a very open relationship with Christ and that's what the Lord had with His heavenly Father, the great God Jehovah. 
And so he says, you sit here and I'm going over there and pray by myself. I'm going to go find the will of the Father. And he took with them Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Now if you mark in your Bible, you underline that very heavy because that is a burden. Now a lot of us today pray without burden. We pray without reason. We pray without purpose. We need a good burden for our lost children. We need a good burden for the people that we know in the workplace that blaspheme the very name of God every day. We, you know what? Uh, and, and I know how I am, and you're not that much different than me. A lot of times when I hear the Lord's name blasphemed, all that spills up into me is anger. And I want to just jack their jaws. But what would really be good if it, if it, it stirred up pity for me, for them? That, that's the best thing. What did the Lord say? If he smite thee on thy left cheek, turn to him the right cheek also. Right? And, and so we, then, then we, instead of being angry and upset, what we should do is pray for them. And, and beg the Lord that he might see fit to, to stir them up. Also, I want you to see the three insiders in the inner loop. They went with him and went a little further. You know what New Testament church needs tonight? We need about three or four or five men that will go a little bit further. That will do something a little bit more than the routine. The other nine were average people. But three of them went further. And let me say something about the other nine. One of them was a devil. One of them was a devil. Judas Iscariot, the Bible said, was a devil from the beginning. And so we see then, he then gets this little three people group and they would be willing to go a little further. He's burdened down. In verse 39, he says, and he went a little further. So the group went further. And then the Lord Jesus Christ went further still. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now, what a wonderful and glorious prayer. It's, I think, in this gospel, but it may be the gospel of Mark, that this transpired over about an hour. And then he went again and transpired, transpired over another hour. And then he went again and another hour passed away. Three, three hours of prayer. I would dare say nobody in this room has ever spent three consecutive hours in prayer. And if you are embarrassed to say so, I'll be the first one. I never have. Not three consecutive hours back to back, really seeking the face of God. Now I want you to see what was he seeking God about. The perfect will of the Father. That's what he wanted. We find Paul, that's what Paul wanted after he was redeemed, after he was saved. He wanted the perfect will of the Father. And here we find the Lord Jesus Christ praying for the very same thing. Lord, put me in your will. Show me what you would need to do. Show me what is the best thing. I want to be in your will. Now, let's, let, let's say this for sure. He knew what the will of the Father was. And listen, tonight, if we'd be truthful, if we're anywhere close to the person of Christ, we know what His will is, we just don't want to do it. Right. Now, listen, this is way beyond a little country boy's mind. But somehow, He and the Father, and again, Christ was sinless. And for Christ to be sinless, and I know that it's true, but yet he was needing to be put in the will of the Father. It don't quite add up to me, but I know it's so. And so I want you to see that he was revealing his humanity, who he was. He had to find the will of God. And not only was he told once, but he was told, told three separate times. Yes, you must go. Yes, you must go. Yes, you must go. That is, that is something beyond my understanding. That he was told three separate times, 
This is my will for you. And if the very Son of God from all heaven was told three separate times, what about you? What about you? You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not convinced anymore. You know, everybody used to say, especially when I was a young preacher 20 plus years ago now, well, I just don't see the Lord calling nobody. It must be time for the coming of Christ. It ain't that He quit calling them. It's they quit going. That, that, that is the problem. Uh, they quit being obedient. Men no longer want to preach the gospel. They've got two other, they've got other fish to fry. They've got other things they want to do. And so it's not that he's not calling. It's men that are not going, here am I. Remember when Isaiah got in the will of God, what was Isaiah's thing? He says, here I am, send me, send me. I'll do it, I'll go. So we live in a day where God's men are not willing. It's not that he's changed his course. It's not that he's changed what his plan is. It's the obedience of the redeemed and the obedience of the saved. So we find the Lord Jesus Christ praying very specifically, let it pass from me. And it could not be that way. Uh, verse 40, I just want you to catch the last end of that. What, when the Lord Jesus Christ finds his two again, or his three again, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Now, I want you to see this inner group that was supposed to be praying in this spot, and the Lord Jesus Christ is over here laid out in this spot, that they went to sleep on the job. You know what? I really believe what, what, what's wrong with churches today is the men are asleep on the job. Now, I know it from my own self. Listen, when I left South Road years ago, I was a dirty dog and, and I, I was a tyrant and all that goes in with that. But you know what? There were men that let me down. You can say what you will. The three or the four or the seven or whatever you have, they need to be praying for their pastor. And you know what? This is what I have found. If the pastor really is the problem, he'll leave on his own. If God's people are praying as they should. And so we see then that, that these men fell asleep, literally fell asleep on the job and was not vying for the Lord Jesus Christ, was not, not praying for Him as they, as they should. Verse 42, Oh, oh my Father, if this cup, this death, this bitterness, this hardness, oh my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Now again, that is getting down to the perfect will of the Father. Listen, tonight we need to be in the perfect will of the Father. We're fixing to get the blessing and the benefit of a brand new year that lays out before us. 2017, laying back, laying out before us, ready for another year. And you know what? We should go with that and Lord, what will that have me to do? In this brand new year, what would be your will for my life? Not what I want, not what I want to do, but what do you want? What would be pleasing to you in this new year that lies ahead of me? Sell yourself out completely. Now, when you do that, remember this, that your pastor said so, because I want you to be there. But when you're sold out, what happened to Paul? And what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ? The very same thing happened to them both. They both died. But you know, when we die to self, it really doesn't matter that we die literally, does it? If we've really been sold out to the Lord, you arrive at the point, well, this must be the very will of God. And not only, not only do you not resist it, you almost say, praise the Lord that I am found worthy. And that's where we need to be. And so we find then that as the Lord Jesus Christ is coming down to the very will of God, it shows us where we need to be. Now, go with me very quickly to the book of Romans. And I just want to give you an example. All of you know it. But there is a perfect will for every church. A church to be in unity is everything. A church being 
close to the Lord is very, very necessary. A church that is uh, near to what the Lord would have us to be it is a very, very necessary thing. Um, we, it, is, it is something that we uh, almost take for granted, but the church needs on be, to be on together. Uh, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in the very first verse, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, it is reported commonly, that means routinely, more than once, it is reported commonly that there's fornication, that's sexual intercourse outside the marriage bond. It is reported commonly that there's fornication among you, and such, forca such fornication is not seen much, as much named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, or proud, or indignant at that. And not rather mourn, he that have done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as being as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning them that have done this deed. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we gathered together, and my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, the church at Corinth had a man that was completely outside the will of God, having a relationship which was, I hope, would have been his stepmother. Because it said his father's wife, not his mother. But involved in an incestuous relationship with his father's wife. And he says, listen, when y'all come together, get rid of him. Put him outside the church. Now, uh, he needs to be disciplined, in other words. And he, he, he's, not a, he's not a worthy member. He's not doing what he should be. Get him out of the group when you come back together. And, you, you know, I trust that they did. The, I trust that they did that. Now, let me say this. Because of the second letter, I think they did because they got some things right. But it's no record that they did it. We need to be in unison as the will of the church too. In other words, New Testament church, we give ourselves to the Lord. Whatever you'd have us to do, we'll do it. We're not many. We're, there's not a bunch of us. But what you'd have us to do, we'll do it if you give us the job to do. And that, 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 So in addition to self saying, here I am, do what you would have me to do. I want to be in your will. We need to do that as a church. Now... In the modern day, this is the problem. Can a person who's lost be in the will of God? Never. That is an impossibility. Would you agree with me with that? How can someone possibly be in the will of God if they're lost? Everything about them is against God, right? So, if you have a mixed multitude, in other words, you have redeemed that are redeemed and in the church, and you have lost that say they're in the church, then you have a mixed multitude, do you not? Be very wary of that. Be, be very cautious of that. Because, listen, uh, you know what happened? We read that on Sunday in the book of Nehemiah that that separating out from a mixed multitude is a painful thing to do, but sometimes must be done. So give yourself to the Master. Give yourself everything that you have. Now I want to read in one more place in Acts chapter 5. I don't like ending on a bad note. But we have to read of these two individuals that said they did and they didn't. Said that, yeah, I'm sold out. And they weren't. They said, yeah, I'll get all. And they only gave part, right? And the first verse the Bible says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it. And, bought a, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, first of all, we should teach our children to tithe from day one. And not bring a certain part, 
but bring a tithe and an offering before the Lord. Now, in the apostolic day, and listen, again, it's if the Lord led this group to meet all together for a whole year, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. You know what? If we did, we'd have to share some things, wouldn't we? If I, if I didn't work for a year to preach to the needs of the church, me and Don would be at lacking X number of dollars, right? And so, and, and that was the thing, was they were just living as a commune environment. They were sharing what they had, and they were enjoying the presence of the Lord. And here we have these two people, a woman and a man, a man and his wife, that were fakes and nothing more. And you know how we can say they were fakes? They only give part. How many do you think on a routine pace, basis only gives part? And I'm not talking about your money. You know, you look around at the, at the group we have. God's been good to this church Amen. financially. Amen. That's, not my, that's not my point. But what have you given to Christ? I mean, how much are you keeping back? And I dare say, every one of us is guilty of keeping something back all the time. You know, we, we need to be sold out for Christ. Our, our concern should not be, how can I get ahead a little bit? Because listen, this world is very temporal, very short. And really all that goes beyond this, it's not movies. It's not cars, it's not automobiles, it's not video games. Listen, all that matters is what you've done for Christ. There, there, there's nothing, nothing more than what you've done for Christ. You know what? I, I would give you a challenge tomorrow. Turn this off for two hours. Completely off. And it zips. See, if you turn it completely off, and this might be an eye-opener, it don't buzz anymore. You don't hear it vibrating because it's off. Right? Completely shut down, off, no. And, and you know what? You will have time, more time for the things of the Lord because you won't be going. And, and you know, uh, it always amazes me, and I've caught myself doing this, uh, praying for you, sin, and then scrolling to see what else is going on further down. Am I really praying for them? No. And just the immediacy that we respond to. You know, I know people spend a lot of time on there because I might put something there uh, in a 10 second sweater. Oh, I pray for you, Brother Lavery. Well, somebody was sitting there on go, wasn't they? It's a thing that consumes our life. And we have to be certain that we keep it in its pro proper its proper place. And so we find that with Ananias and Sapphira, they lied to God. They weren't sold out. They weren't given to the things of God. Rather, they kept back a part of itself for themselves. Now notice in verse 5, And Ananias hearing these words, and I will show you in verse, verse 4, but this was it. Why has Satan filled thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Now, Ananias never answers this question. But you know, the only way that someone is uh, filled with demons, just like the man Legion, just like the uh, uh, down to whom seven devils were cast out, all those individuals, the one thing they had in common is this, is that they were lost. Because the Bible says when you're saved, you're, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. And if you're sealed, the demon can't pass there. If it's a seal made by God, no other spiritual being is going to go past it. But if you're a faith, like Ananias and Sapphira were, they were just faith. He says to them, why has Satan filled your heart? And the answer says, because I've never been born again to start with. I've never been saved. I don't even know what you're talking about. He said, and I fell out and gave up the ghost. See, he wasn't sold out. He pretended to be. He may believe that he was, but he wasn't sold out for the cause of Christ. My question for you tonight, are you? You remember Mary? Mary the mother? Suppose Christmas time is coming up. 
Remember, in the Gospel of Luke, when the angel Gabriel appeared unto her and told her what was going to come to pass, does anybody know what she said? Be it so unto me even now. She was sold out. And that, you know, today, in a day and age today, when an unwed mother, we throw a party for them. Listen, they don't deserve a baby shower. And you say, oh, you're getting on into bad stuff. No. Uh, you know what? If a child needs something, I'll get it, but I'm not going to make holiday out of it. Because you know what? The Bible says that it's fornication. Right? And, 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 you know, but today they have all these big fun times. But you know what? In that day, they dealt with fornication a little bit di differently. In that day, they dealt with sexual sin. And they took them outside the city and they stoned them to death. That's how the problem was dealt with. And here we find this little maiden uh, who, who the Lord sends Gabriel to appear. And she says, be it so unto me now. That's the perfect will of my life. I may be losing my head. The rocks may get to be flying tomorrow. But listen, be it so unto me now. That is where we need to be. We need to quit holding back, do we not? Just do what he has to do. Oh.